We'll be covering two whole chapters in Nehemiah today. It might kind of surprise you, but you ought not to be surprised because these final chapters in Nehemiah contain uh, several lists of names. <clears throat> and uh, I just have a few things to say about these lists before we get too far into the sermon. These lists produce an accurate, verifiable snapshot in history. It would have been a lot easier for the writers of the Bible to not be so detailed. Have you ever thought of that before? If they were to write broadly instead of with such detail contained in lists like we have today, it would be um, much more difficult to fact check them and verify them, but they were very detailed. So what is our practice, our private practice, when you encounter lists of names? Now, the approach is different from the pulpit because we're gathered here today to be edified, and it wouldn't be very edifying if I read all these names. But in your private practice, what, is, what do you do when you come to these names? What are our attitudes toward these lists? Well, to me personally, it seems dishonoring to God and to the individuals to skip them entirely. I mean, after all, the Holy Spirit included them in what we say is the God-breathed and inspired word. And so here they are, lists. So I would suggest skim, if you will, but skip, will you not? <laughs> we can learn some things from these lists. I mean, there are things that come to mind. And some of them are obvious, so I just want to point out a few things. One is each name represents a person, person who was born, person who lived a life, and a person who died. Now that's pretty obvious, but we often don't consider that. They are all gone from the face of the earth, and not one of them listed in the Bible remains. They're all gone. In the eyes of God, the individuals lived a life that was either worthy or blameworthy, and every person in that list right now is either in glory or eternal damnation. That's pretty heavy to think about things like that. But it, it's generally not thought of by most people whenever we arrive at lists like this. So that's the first one. The second one is this. The Bible declares the value of human life. Everyone is significant. Here's someone whose name is there. Forever preserved in Holy Scripture, that's significance. Everyone is significant. The evil that is perpetrated or the good that's accomplished, it really does matter. It has lasting effects and consequences. Now, I want to cherry pick one verse out of a list in, in um, Nehemiah chapter 11. In verse 17, we read of this guy. Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, who was the leader in beginning the thanksgiving at prayer. Now this is how my mind runs, my imagination, whenever I reach a list like this. One day there was a great rejoicing in the household of Micah because a son had been born. And they named him Mataniah. And they were greatly blessed to have a son. And young Madaniah had a grandpa, Grandpa, grandpa Zabdi. And he had a great grandpa, grandpa great grandpa Asaph. Now, whether or not these two men were alive at this point in time, 
We don't know. We're not given that information. But think of the providence here. He'd been born a Levite. That's providential. You can't choose your parents, after all. That's what the saying goes. So we ought to praise God for a godly heritage, those of us that have it. It's very valuable. Well, Madaniah lived and rose to a place of prominence. And here he had become a leader in the prayer of thanksgiving. Every, you see, every life is significant. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. Your life is more than significant. It's of exceeding great value. Because Jesus said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? That's great significance for every life. And significance isn't based on prominence. It's based on the fact that you were created in the image of God. Therefore, you have significance. Not because you've done some great thing. Your life is significant right now. Think of this, there was a time when Madaniah was just a young boy. He was running around the streets doing what young boys did back in those days. Was his life insignificant then? It wasn't. It was significant. God had plans for him and used him. Well, those are just some, some thoughts that I had at the very beginning in regard to these lists. But chapter 11 describes the account of Nehemiah's actions to repopulate Jerusalem. The wall has been finished since um, chapter 6 and verse 15. And remarkably, it was finished in 52 days, we're told there in that chapter 6, because the work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Um, In chapter 7 of Nehemiah, we're told that the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few. There were no houses. They had yet to be rebuilt. So Nehemiah is now, in chapter 11, dealing with that problem that was spoken of in chapter 7. Sparse population. They were vulnerable. And so he is addressing this yet unresolved problem. A man I read named Finlayson, he said this, there was altogether, this was altogether worthy of Nehemiah's practical wisdom. The restored walls of Jerusalem could not do much to promote its security and welfare so long as it was inhabited by a mere handful of people. They needed to increase the population of Jerusalem to defend it. So how did they do it? Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine-tenths remained in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Now these are the heads of the provinces who lived in Jerusalem, but in the cities of Judah, each lived on his own property in their cities. So how did he go about repopulating Jerusalem? Well, he has, there are volunteers and there are draftees here listed. Um, This word volunteer, we see it in verse 2. Those who volunteered to live in Jerusalem, that same word elsewhere in the Bible is translated with a phrase like this, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him. That's volunteering. Now think about how large a part of work is done for the good of the community by volunteers and for the good of the church. Men and women who willingly offer themselves to do things, things that have no more demand on them than they do anybody else, but they volunteer to do it and they do it graciously. 
I've never thought so much about volunteers as I have in preparing this sermon. The willingness of individuals to undertake more than their obvious share in labors for the common good, it's admirable. Robert Hawker said this, Certain it is, however, that those who volunteered to live there were considered true patriots and had the blessing of the people. Even now it requires much grace to step forward in the cause of Jesus and declare ourselves to be volunteers in his cause. We have volunteers here in the church. Angela playing the piano. It's voluntary. Alan with the treasury. It's voluntary. Largely thankless. Volunteering is admirable. Volunteering is courageous. And volunteering is impacting. Jesus spoke about going the extra mile. We have adopted that phrase. And we use it whenever we describe someone who's doing more voluntarily than they were asked to do. It's going the extra mile, we say. Volunteering. David volunteered to fight Goliath. You realize that? And it's admirable, courageous, impacting. Because we read in 1 Samuel 17, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, by your life, O king, I do not know. It was such, so admirable, this courage. We're told about a guy in 2 Chronicles 17 whose name was Amasiah. It says there, he volunteered for the Lord. That's quite a phrase. Have you ever considered volunteering for the Lord? Doing something just because it's for the Lord. We're told in Psalm 110 and verse 3, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. Well, volunteering is admirable <clears throat> and impacting, but sincere appreciation is also impacting. These volunteers were recognized and blessed by the people. You have that in verse 2. The people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Appreciation. There's an opportunity for us to think about that as well. Am I appreciative? Appreciation. Experience tells us not to count on it. If you're going to volunteer, don't do it because you're going to be appreciated because you might not ever. So appreciation, don't count on it. Appreciation, propriety, compels us to be more free in expressing it. I'm not as free in expressing appreciation as I should be. And maybe you aren't either. But uh, overall, the most excellent way is not desire or do something out of the motive of being appreciated, receiving appreciation from people, but do it to receive appreciation from God. Paul used this phrase, then each man's praise will come to him from God. And Jesus spoke of that entry into heaven. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So there were some that volunteered, and then there were others that were drafted, one out of ten. And uh, in those days, they determined the will of the Lord on many occasions by casting a lot. Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. 
So Nehemiah said, one out of every 10 will cast lots. It's fair. And one out of every 10 came to live in the city of Jerusalem. Think about attitudes in all of this. It wasn't long ago we heard a series of sermons on Jonah. Was Jonah a volunteer? <laughs> he was the furthest thing from it. He was forced to go to Nineveh. Jeremiah, he reluctantly accepted his commission, but he did accept it and go. God said, I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah responded, alas, Lord, I don't know how to talk and I'm just a kid. He reluctantly, but positively accepted his commission. Isaiah, on the other hand, he famously volunteered. Who shall I send and who will go for us? He said, here am I, send me. All of these different attitudes in regard to the will of the Lord. Volunteering for the Lord. Here am I, send me, he says. Well, what about the greatest of all volunteers, the Lord Jesus? <laughs> in view of the inadequacies of sacrifices, as they're described in Hebrews 10 and verse 7, these words from the Old Testament were ascribed to the Lord Jesus. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it's written of me, to do your will, O God. And Jesus himself said in John 10, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one's taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. What a volunteer! Christ Jesus in regard to redemption. We sing of it in that song, And Can It Be? The third verse says, He left His Father's throne above, so free, so infinite His grace, and emptied Himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Christ Jesus would have volunteer for the Lord. Well, I don't have much to say on the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> but when we arrive in chapter 12, there's a great celebration. By the time we get to verse 27 of chapter 12, these sections containing large lists of people that were residing in Jerusalem and in other cities, the priests and the Levites, and so on. By the time we get to verse 27 of chapter 12, we read these words. Now, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem so that they might celebrate the dedication with gladness with hymns of thanksgiving and with songs to the accompaniment of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Well, here's a celebration, and it's in connection with the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem that I pointed out was completed several chapters ago, and now they're going to dedicate it. Jerusalem is populated, and they're going to dedicate it. And it's good and it's right to celebrate when God has given us some sort of place of achievement and accomplishment. Ezra did it when the temple was complete in Ezra chapter 6. Sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the exiles, they celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They dedicated the temple and had a great celebration and a feast. 
And it said there, for the Lord had caused them to rejoice. So they were not only celebrating, but they were dedicating, just like Nehemiah's group today. Now, one of the primary elements of true celebration is the expression of joy. Because a celebration without joy, what is that? (laughs) It's empty. It's just an empty ritual. Joy. We Christians ought to be characterized by a general attitude of joy. The more we walk under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the more we'll be joyful because He produces joy. Love, joy, peace. Joy is second on that list. Why is it that many Christians appear gloomy and sullen? I mean, I could see a downturn in, in our emotions on an occasion, but by and large, we ought to be a joyful people. Some are always pointing out their inadequacies. And they're constantly highlighting their weaknesses and they're focusing on the sins that so easily beset them rather than on the Savior who has covered them. I've used this illustration before. It's like a a man who has a, a beautiful mansion set in a pristine place. But he's a sullen guy. And so a visitor comes and is admiring the beauty of his mansion and the place that it's at, the setting and all of that. And he says, yes, but come with me. And he takes him into the back room all the way in the back and he opens the trash can and says, look at all this refuse in the trash can. It's like that. But it shouldn't be that way. <clears throat> sure, there, there are inescapable times of sorrow and grief, but when our focus is on ourselves, there is plenty to lament. Really, when I dwell on what I am compared to what I should be, it tends to produce a downcast countenance. But when I turn and I look at the Savior and I see what I am in Him, then it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Someone said you can choose to either stand in the sunlight or you can go and stand in the shadows. Choose to stand in the sunlight. (laughs) It can be that simple. Alexander McLaren is a man I've been reading, he says this, you can either fix your attention upon and make the predominant subject of your religious contemplations a truth which shall make you glad and strong, or a half-truth which shall make you sorrowful and therefore weak. Your meditations may either center mainly on your own selves, your faults, your failings, and the like, or They may center mainly upon God and His love, Christ and His grace, the Holy Spirit and His communion. If your thoughts are chiefly occupied with God and what He has done and is for you, then you'll have peaceful joy. If, on the other hand, they're bent over on yourself and your own unbelief, then you'll always be sad. You can make your choice. There's reality in that. Jesus wants us to be joyful. He said, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. And when he prayed, and his prayers are always answered in John 17, he praying to God said, these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Christ highlighted joy. Again, Alexander McLaren. Real sorrow, true, because still I'm wrestling with sin. Sorrow, because still I have not perfect fellowship. 
sorrow because my eyes, purified by my living with God, see earth and sin and life and death and the generations of men in the darkness beyond. In some measure I see it as God sees it, and yet the sorrow is surface and the joy is central. The sorrow springs from circumstance and the gladness from the core of the thing, and therefore my sorrow is transitory, but the gladness is perennial forever. I think of that verse, all my springs of joy are in you. A spring is way down. It's down in the water table. And what's down there comes gushing out at the surface. Joy. Joy differs from happiness, you know, because happiness is liking the present moment because it's pleasing to me, so I'm happy. But happiness comes from things that happen. Happiness is fleeting because the circumstances that produce it are constantly changing. It's like a big wheel, and that which is on top goes to the bottom, and that which is on the bottom goes to the top. Circumstances are like that, and so happiness is fleeting. But joy runs much deeper. It's long-range. Someone used that term. Joy is long-range. It's based on being accepted by God in Christ Jesus. If that's the case for you, you have all reason to be joyful, regardless of your circumstance. Joy appreciates the past, it appreciates the present and the future, not because the circumstances are pleasing, but because your heart is right with God. Happiness comes from without, but joy from within. True joy, circumstances can't change that. They can make you unhappy, circumstances, for the time, but they cannot affect joy. Happiness fades quickly, but joy lasts forever. Now, these people are celebrating the dedication of the wall with great joy, and they're happy because the wall's finished. I mean, that was hard work. (laughs) The circumstance changed. The work's done. I'm happy. That makes me happy. But they were joyful because the Word tells us God was with them to help them finish it. You see the difference? Happy because the work's done. Joyful because, man, God helped us and we got it done in 52 days. There's a difference there. One day sorrows will be gone forever, but deep deep joy will remain. Is there any sorrow in heaven? It's all joy. So why not prepare for heaven now? That's the way I look at it. Be joyful now. It's our duty to be joyful. We're told in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He repeated it twice. So it's our duty. It's my sworn duty to be joyful. (laughs) It doesn't seem to go together, does it? But it is. Now, some temperaments, I understand, are naturally gloomy. And they're challenged that way. Sometimes I'm a guy who sees the glass half empty instead of half full. Temperamentally that way. But that can't be an excuse for me to not be joyful when I'm commanded to be joyful, when Jesus wants me to be joyful and prayed to that end, and he accomplished everything that should make me joyful. Who am I to say, man, I'm just born with this temperament and this is just the way I am? It's actually a deficiency in faith. Because we're told in another place there's joy and peace in believing. (laughs) Well, in your presence is fullness of joy. If I were to be in the presence of the Lord more, I'd be more joyful. And I'd have to say you as well. There's an old Scottish preacher. He said this, If there is but little heat around the bulb of the thermometer, 
No wonder the, that the mercury marks a low degree. <laughs> we need more heat around the bulb of the thermometer. Well, Christians more than all other people have reason to be joyful. <clears throat> Jesus said, rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Now, that was an instruction to his disciples. And why is it that we often take the word of God like the, an illustration, like a, a man walking on thin ice, and he slips one foot out gingerly, gently, and doesn't put much weight on it because he doesn't trust the ice. He thinks at any moment it's going to crack and he's going to fall through. And we take verses like this, rejoice that your names are written in heaven, like that, like a man walking on thin ice. It's like we're afraid to put our full weight on that, like it might fall through for us. But think about it for a minute. Who did Jesus say this to? Did he say it to spiritual giants? He said it to spiritual babes, the same ones who argued over who was greater, the same ones who were indignant because two of them thought that it was a good idea to bring mom in and try to secure a prominent place in heaven for them, and the same ones who were reproved by Jesus at least on three different occasions for having a little faith. The same ones, the same group that wanted to call down fire from heaven and consume the Samaritans and were reproved by Jesus for it. The same ones who were sleeping when they should have been praying and were reproved by Jesus for it. The same ones who at Jesus' arrest fled and left him alone, one of which later denied that he even knew him. And the same ones who were reproved by Jesus when they refused to believe the women who came back from the empty tomb saying that he was risen. And they were reproved by Jesus for it. To that group right there, he said, rejoice, your names are written in heaven. So that ought to give me reason, license if you want to call it that, to rejoice. Not because I'm a spiritual giant, because none of them were. They had warts and blemishes just like you and I. So I say that more fully with this one point. The other points will be very quick. Because I, I saw it in the text, and it was made alive to me more than, than maybe ever. And that is, we have license, we have reason, we have commandment, we to rejoice as Christians. If you're not a Christian here today, you don't have that. You ought to be fearful, very fearful, because like I pointed out at the beginning in these lists, the end is coming for you. It's inescapable. And then you stand before the Maker, your Creator, and give an account. And if your sins are not covered by the sacrifice of Christ, that I've been speaking of that gives joy to every believer, the end is very gloomy and ruinous, disastrous. Well, <clears throat> this celebration, this dedication of the wall, it was accomplished with great joy, in which I pointed out. It was accomplished with purification. We have in verse 30, the priests, Levites, purified themselves, and they purified the people, and the gates, and the wall itself. So purification, when it comes to people, no hypocrisy allowed. If you're going to celebrate in Christ Jesus, the hypocrisy has got to be gone. Purity matters. Psalm 24, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Well, in Ezra's occasion of celebration and dedication of the temple, we're told back there they offered 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, all as a sin offering. 
for Israel, and then one male goat corresponding to every one of the 12 tribes. That is a lot of sacrificing at the dedication. Now what you read into that is, that is gallons and gallons of blood spread everywhere. And that was the sacrificial system in those days. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves together, and all of them were pure. And then, after all that, they, sac they sacrificed the Passover lamb. And the sons of Israel who returned from exile and those who had separated themselves from the impurity of the nations joined them to seek the Lord God of Israel and ate the Passover. It all points forward to the Passover lamb. All of that blood, all of that sacrifice, Christ Jesus. So that when we arrive in Hebrews 9, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Purification. To have the conscience pure, it takes the blood of Christ Jesus, the Passover Lamb. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave, us, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Hebrews says, after making purification for sins, he sat down. Purification. Max's sermon, when he was here, on the Beatitudes, that Beatitude, it's the pure in heart that are blessed because they're the ones who will see God. Purification. So that was at the dedication of this wall, right there with joy. And then there was thanksgiving <clears throat> as well. In verse 31, we're told this, they had the leaders of Judah come up on top of the wall and I appointed two great choirs. The first, proceeding to the right on top of the wall, you skip down to verse 38, the second choir proceeding to the left, while I followed them with half of the people on the wall. And then verse 40, and the two choirs took their stand in the house of God. So they went opposite directions around the wall, two great choirs with great joy expressing great thanksgiving. Great thanksgiving. So do we express thanksgiving like we should? In verse 46, the leaders of the singers, songs of praise and hymns of thanksgiving to God. They did a lot of singing on that day. <clears throat> So through Him, through Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name. Yes. Celebration <clears throat> with joy, with purity, with thanksgiving. And with appreciation. Because we're told in verse... 44 at the very end. Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who served. That's kind of interesting. They rejoiced over the priests and the Levites. And as the chapter ends, ends up, they give their sacrifices, their, they bring their first fruits, their tithes, they gather them in from the fields and the cities the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. And the priests and the Levites themselves set apart the consecrated portion for the sons of Aaron, the very last verse of the chapter. So there's thanksgiving here and appreciation uh, for the services and for the support of others. Well, these things are all contained in the dedication of the wall. So here's a New Year's resolution since Joe brought it up. I wasn't going to talk about it, but since he did. 
resolutions, I mean. Here's a resolution for you. Be more joyful in Christ Jesus this year. What is that famous quote from Bob Jennings? He lamented that he made the Christian life so hard. (laughs) Get our eyes off of ourselves and our own failings and how inadequate we are and our weaknesses and all the sins we wrestle with and all of that and focus them on the Savior that covers all of that and rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Well, amen. We've got one more chapter left in Nehemiah. <clears throat> and we'll move on from there. <clears throat>